was a Berliner, but I now come from the countryside. I'm a pirate in the state of Brandenburg, which is the state surrounding Berlin, so it's not too far away. Um, I am a business consultant and trainer by profession, worked 15 years for the IT industry, for companies like Microsoft or McKinsey or Accenture. Um, but one and a half year ago, I uh, became self-employed and empowering women to break glass ceilings and that was one business and the other one is opening up governments and politics to make more transparent and participative. And that is why um, in May this year I came after a long thinking process because I was a member of the Green Party. I came to join the Pirate Party because that's the one political initiative in Germany engaging most in opening up politics and making it more transparent and participative. And that is what I mean. Yeah, I'm Fabricio. I joined the Pirate Party for very personal reasons. I've been traveling 10 years before I came to Berlin in 2010, together with my partner who is there. She's a Indian US citizen, being a Brazilian, I am a Brazilian German citizen, so our children have four passports, and we have three children, so we have lots of money to pay for passports, and it's not fun. And for that, I think, just like the internet doesn't know geopolitical borders, we should go to a world where we can be active whatever we are and do politics in the normal sense of politics, but even each act that you do in a supermarket or whatever you do has a political context that affected the world, impacted the world. And that's why I joined the Pirate Party and I'm now in the BVV in the City Council of Panko for the Pirate Party in the Beirat for Migration and for the Green Party I'm in the Ausschuss for Migration, that's the special Committee for the Migrants. Hey everybody, I'm uh, Jan Hemmel. I'm a um, political scientist by trade. I worked as a uh, consultant for strategic communications. Political oh, scientist. Please. And I joined the Pirate Party in 2011 and uh, I'm a spokesperson for the um, State Working Group of Berlin for Economics and the Environment. And I'm a very active uh, Pirate Party member offering motions for the uh, state parliament, for the parliamentary group, um, drawing motions for um, our general assembly, next one is in uh, November in uh, Bochum. Um, and I'm a very big advocate for liberal democracy and for a uh, feedback software tool that we're using for the inner party um, uh, decision making process. Uh, <coughs> My name is Robert Levine. I'm just another American who came here to work out of his house to try to eke out a living from American media companies. Uh, I wrote a book called Free Ride, which is about how technology companies are destroying said media business. Not, not technology, technology companies. And I, right now, having done this, I also write for Business Week and the New York Times and some other publications. And I obviously, um, you know, the book is journalistic, but I certainly have a point of view. Um, I disagree with the Pirate Party on copyright, but I think a lot of the other things they're doing are, are very interesting. And I'd like to add that um, you can purchase this book from God. <laughs> after. It's actually, I've read it, it's, it's, a, it's really important if you're interested in anything to do with media, anything to do with media, um, culture, copyright, and so on. It's a really informative read. You want to find out why your friends are unemployed? This explains that. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to get to that later. Um, the I, the Pirate Party, I guess, it was founded in Sweden in, in 2006, um, and as the name of the party suggests, it was you know it was linked to this file sharing network Pirate Bay. And I guess, you know, because they're called the pirates, a lot of people think of piracy. And um, so one of the founding, I guess the founding idea was about internet freedom. You know, like a free internet, sharing information on the internet. Now, in Berlin, somehow it's evolved into something more than that. Maybe, I don't know, Anke, you could start off like, what is different now than the sort of one issue party that 
was founded in Sweden. Like, what, what has it become now for you? When it has uh, various aspects. One is still the notion of a free internet for everybody, which you find in aspects such as net neutrality, where we do not want um, package transport in the internet to be dependent on what service you use or what company you use the service of, so that some bits are transferred faster compared to others. So that, that is one of the aspects. Another one is that we do not want um, to criminalize the entire generation of the digital society just because they use, for example, file sharing from private to private. We are not against copyright, in case you know that you hope it's wrong. I don't know whether you did, many journalists do that. We are not against copyright, but we are against criminalization of a private electronic copy. What you can do with a printed book is you can take it and you can borrow it to whoever you like. And if you didn't like the book, you don't need to borrow it, you just bring it to a second hand shop and resell it. But you cannot do it with an e-book. Why not? So not the same rights are applied to the e-book sphere and you don't even take something away from somebody because if you do take a copy, the original file is still there. So nobody has any harm. And what we want about that. <laughs> what we want is a free access to knowledge, to culture, to science outcomes, open access for scientific uh, things. And we believe that it's the first time ever in the history of humankind that we have this universal access theoretically available for everybody, regardless whether they are rich or live in a very big city with huge libraries and theaters, etc. They could theoretically, if they have a broadband access, have possibility to, to touch this knowledge and get access to this culture everywhere in the world. And we believe that this will push development of humankind, make them more equal, push development, etc. So that's that one sphere. But our program is much, much bigger. For example, on the continuum, on wanting everything transparent, Everything does not really mean everybody. It means government and politics in the first hand. So what we want is a transparent government, maximal transparency, open data, open contracts. We want to know what members of parliament get money from, whom they get it from, what they get it for, how much they do get, things like that, which are not published right now in Germany, not really, so to say. But on the other hand, what we do not want is the transparent citizen. So we have exactly the opposite at the other side of this continuum, where we see that the power of the digital society is abused to spy on people, and where a state government, which is made for us and paid by us with our tax money, actually tries to survey us in our private lives, and that must not be. So one very big part of what pirate party policy is taking care of is trying to push boundaries back again and tell governments so far and not more. We don't want data retention. We are not everybody a terrorist and you have to sneak into our mobile phones and our internet traffic and just look what we do, whom we talk to, whom we are connected to. All these things we do not want. So these are major issues which are not totally new, but which many years ago have not been so much um, probably connected with the name of the Pirate Party, but they are originally rooted in there. And sometimes they actually do overlap. If you remember the Sopa, Pipa, Akta story, these have been laws taking the intention, which I think was just made up, to protect copyright for the poor artists, but in fact they wanted to protect very big monopolies and they wanted to open up the internet for public spy uh, architecture. And they want to, to just survey communication of people and use that and open the doors for that. And all these laws have been drafted by lobbyists and been developed without people, ordinary citizens involved. No civil society, no transparent processes, 
had no idea what was going on. So that was one of the cases where these things overlap, what we demand to not survey us as private people. And on the other hand, if you do laws, then do it transparent and do involve the people because these laws concern us. Okay, so we've raised the we've got we've dove right into the copyright issue. Um, I mean, this is like a, it is kind of a founding idea of the principle behind the Pirate Party. Um, Rob, um, uh, not that long ago, I think you, you told me something like, anyone who is involved in a, an artistic profession, a creative, a creative industries, should be scared of the Pirate Party. Yeah, I mean, I think everybody should be, I mean, look, I think what you say, I think what you say about transparency and privacy is very important. I think you're in favor of legalizing marijuana, which, I don't know if it's important, but I'm sure I'm all for that. But I think, let me read you something from my book. This is from the um, United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights, written in 1948, before there were record company lobbyists. Um, Everyone has the right to the protection of the moral and material interests resulting from any scientific, literary, or artistic production of which he is the author. That basically establishes that copyright is a human right. Now, that doesn't mean it should last 70 years after the death of the author. I think that's absurd. It doesn't mean that it should cover everything it now covers. I think it's gone too far. But to my knowledge, the Pirate Party is the only party that has been founded specifically against a human right as delineated by the UN. Specifically against it. And when they say they were doing this as a political, they said they were doing this as political advocacy. Everything in the court file, which was the, the court file for the Pirate Bay case, was taken when they seized the servers. One thing the Pirate Bay doesn't seem to know is that you can't encrypt your email. They talk about selling ads for a lot of money. They talk about hiding all their money. The Pirate Bay, despite saying they're a political advocacy group, they are the only political advocacy group, to my knowledge, that has a private Swiss bank account. So all of that money that they were making on other people's work went into the Swiss bank account, obviously untransparent, no way to pay, no way to charge them taxes. So, so you have a party that comes out of a criminal organization that's dedicated to undercutting one human right, but I think their ideas on transparency and privacy are excellent. <laughs> The Pirate Party started in Sweden, that's why. First, the German Pirate Party has no strong ties to the Swedish Pirate Party, you can't even compare them. But secondly, the Pirate Party was not founded by the Pirate Bay, or by members of the Pirate Bay, or for the Pirate Bay, that's all not, not true. Um, it, it came the out of the same, some of the same Pirate people the same Party background. does not directly come from Pirate Bay, it comes from the anti pirate Bureau. And the anti pirate bureau was an agency founded by very big monopolies, movie associations, movie companies. Who, who movie says they're companies. monopolies? Hmm? When you say they're monopolies, has any court or government decided they're monopolies, or that's just your no, theory? No, that's just me, and it may be totally wrong, but you, I probably just use the denomination of very big business power companies. Like, like that's that's Google has an antitrust investigation. No media company does. That was not Google. It was movie, music, and this type of business which perceived themselves as being pirated. And they coined the term anti pirate bureau. That was the name of the agency in Sweden. And they offended ordinary Swedish citizens. And you have to know that in Sweden, that was the first and up to now only country which had in 1996 a broadband coverage basically everywhere before all those pirate business was even having the name. So everybody was doing it, but it didn't have a name. Then the pirate downloading stuff, Napster, it was before Napster, they had this broadband coverage. So then Napster came and the rest of the world started to have some broadband. And that is when the big businesses came onto the markets of the world and said, oh my god, what's happening here in Sweden? They just steal stuff from the internet. And that is when they had the anti pirate bureau. And the young people from Sweden, they just considered themselves, I'm not a pirate. I'm just doing what I can do with the internet. I'm not selling it. I'm not making business. I do not have a Swiss bank account. 
I just give this file to other people from my private computer to another private computer. It's no business involved whatsoever. And that was why the party was founded and said, if you want to criminalize the name pirate, we just name ourselves pirate as an answer to the anti pirate war. And it did not come from the Pirate Bay. Actually, the German Pirate Party says, because the Pirate Bay has a business model, which it did have, we do not even approve of it. We only want, we are not against copyright neither. We only do not want to have, we have something like, what is it, 700,000 cases per year against private people because of copyright violations. One Lady Gaga song and you have to pay 2,000 euros. That's ridiculous. And none of those euros ends up with the authors, not even with Lady Gaga, who's, by the way, the richest musician and the most illegally downloaded musician at the same time. So they are not starving because of the internet. <laughs> I don't think ordinary people should ever be sued. And that's not the way I would enforce copyright. I don't think there's anything wrong with enforcing copyright by suing the pirate bay. When you say you're in favor of non-commercial file sharing, I'm eager to hear what your definition of non-commercial file sharing. Because non-commercial file sharing seems to have bought Kim.com, the largest property in New Zealand. Is that non-commercial file sharing? Which one? Kim.com, mega upload. Is that non-commercial? Okay, Pirate Bay is commercial. So what's non-commercial file sharing? Where can I, I, I don't see a lot of that online. What? What? <laughs> what do you live? <laughs> no, no, but if you're using a commercial service, if you're in favor of, what I'm saying is, if you are using a service for free, and someone else is using the service for free, and the service is making money, that's a commercial transaction. Mega upload, anything you do on mega upload is a commercial transaction. It's a commercial business. No, but do something against mega upload, but do not sue H I agree, I agree. So we agree. <laughs> I, I agree with that. Jan, you want to, you want to chime in here? Yeah, um, first of all, thank you for quoting from the book. Uh, just to remind you, I, IFPI was founded in uh, 1933, the international organization of uh, yeah, the, the music industry lobbyists. So they were around way before. Uh, 1949, so I have to correct that. Um, the thing is, we can talk about um, copyright and we can uh, put up the blame or the pirates want to kill copyright, which is a ridiculous, a bogus uh, claim because we don't want to kill copyright, we just want to transform it and um, um, make it in line with um, the realities of the digital world. Because right now, Copyright isn't reflecting the realities of the internet age. That's a problem. It's a problem for the consumers, which we are an advocate for, but it's also a problem for the creators, for the creative artists. Because, as Anke pointed out, um, we have total buyout contracts, so um, a journalist, for example, doesn't see that much money from his work, he doesn't get money when the article is republished, for example, when they are derivative works, doesn't see any money. So that's where we want to change it. We're not trying to abolish it. So you're in no favor of that, that. that should, correct? Because that would give journalists a neighboring right. So the what? The, the what? I'm sorry. I, I the Leistenschutzrecht. Yeah, that would yeah, fix that. It's kind, kind of interesting yeah. because Germany, besides Belgium, is the only country that comes up with such a stupid idea. Sorry for my language, but it's a stupid France idea. Too, and Brazil too. Yeah. yeah. But, but if you want to give journalists money, a law would certainly help. Well, I talk, I, Last, last week uh, at, the, at the Internet Congress of the Green Party, I talked to a representative of the Journalist Union and I asked her, okay, so you're in favor, it, you're in favor of the of the last She said, uh, well, not really, but if, but if, it, if it gets uh, passed, we want, our, we want our share. So that's kind of their position right now. But we are not in favor of the last Can somebody explain you? Oh, the Leistenschutzrecht, it means that the big publishing houses, whenever online, some kind of news aggregator like uh, Flipboard, for example, or Google, quotes the article, the headline plus a short summary, the publishing house gets some money from Google or from Flipboard or from Microsoft or whatever. So it's more or less, we consider it an internet tax. It's the publishers erect a kind of tax 
box at your at your home, and uh, they count whatever like what articles you uh, you access to that uh, aggregator, and uh, Google has to pay for it or Flipboard, whatever. Which means that in the end it will happen like it happened in Belgium. All these aggregators will simply delist the publishing houses. So, uh, Bild, for example, Springer's biggest newspaper, won't get listed in Google search results. Neither will it get listed in Microsoft search results because Microsoft will likely follow. This happened in Belgium. It, it took two weeks after the publishing houses came back to the table and renegotiated. So we will, I think we will see that in Germany too when this ridiculous law gets passed. But it's actually not what happened in Belgium. After happened, two weeks of re no, 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 What happened yeah. in Belgium was the Belgian some organization sued, and what they sued was they said they couldn't be included in Google News. They could be included in Google Search. They said we can't be included in German news, not not because of a new law, because existing European law you don't have fair use. You have statutory exceptions. The statutory exceptions didn't hold true. Google, by using Google News, not Google Search, was breaking the law. Google said, if you don't want to be in Google News, we are using our monopoly power, because that is a monopoly. It is an antitrust investigation in the US, and an antitrust investigation in the EU, and that is two more antitrust investigations than every media company has right now put together. Google used its monopoly power to say, if you won't enrich us with Google News, we are taking you out of Google search using monopoly power that may well be illegal. So that, that, have you heard of robots not TXT? Yes. No, no, no. So, so you're, you're, you're saying, I'm not, you know, they don't have to be listed. But what they said is, we don't want to be, what they said is, we want to be in Google search, but not Google News. Why can't we have the flexibility to do that? And Google said, we're, the big, we're one of the biggest companies in the world play by our rules. Yeah, you don't have that freedom. I'm glad you bring that up because Robert, right now that would be the next thing I, w I wanted to mention. Um, the, they want to have the cake and eat it too because... It, but, but that's yeah, a market, it, not a tax. No, no, it's no, 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 no. It's, they, they are taxing, they are taxing like Google or whomever else is a news aggregator like Viva or Perltaucher before. Um, they are taxing that they list their articles, their content in their search results. And what they're neglecting is that they are living in a symbiotic relationship with them. They are depending on their search results as Google is depending on the publishing houses to be able to offer a service like Google News. Now what happens, what you, what you correctly described was that Google delisted them. We could substitute Google here for any other search engine. Doesn't matter whether it's Google or Bing or whatever. But only one yeah. is that monopoly power. Yeah, but now you say, okay, it's kind of a human right that they are listed there. I didn't yeah. say that. Copyright is a human right. But, this thing is not but, a human but right. What we will see in Germany, and now I'll come to the point, what we will see in Germany is w once the search results are delisted or they, they're not indexed anymore in the search engines, that the big publishing houses then will sue Google and say, all right, uh, we, have a, we have to have universal service here. It's a human right that everybody has to, uh, has to be listed. It's not and a human right. Hold on. No one said it's a human right that everyone has to be listed. You're mixing up well, Google News Christoph, and Google Search. Christoph Kaeser surely says that the, the chief lobbyist. What, what That's what he said. It's a human right. Okay. Springer no. isn't even human, it's a no, corporation. It's not, it's not, okay. <laughs> this is like I stand wrong. corrected, it's not a human right, but they have the right to be listed because being listed is part of the universal service. They should be listed. So like net neutrality. It's kind like of, net neutrality. Yeah, they want to tie in the right to be listed with net neutrality. Right. And the problem is... So this, there should be neutrality for some things, but not for others. That you're, that you're mixing net neutrality the, the transport of information from one point to another point with access to information, like what content is accessed. And that's a problem because they want to draw us into a discussion where they're trying to use our arguments against us by twisting them and mixing them up. Okay, <laughs> this is getting a little technical. Um, but um, I wanted to go back to, I mean, how, 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 do, how do the pirates, for example, then uh, want to ensure that the publishers, the, the writers, the, the musicians, 
the artists and so on. How, how, how do, what ideas do the pirates actually have to ensure that they get paid for their work? And I mean, if everyone's file sharing, downloading, and share, I mean, sharing, like how, yeah, how does that work? I will not comment on that because it's not my field, but I'm looking for to change the theme to politics uh, 2.0 because it's kind of giving a wrong impression. I was getting to that. Can I just, maybe just, I'm gonna yes. one couple sentences on that and then we'll get to that in a second. We've got lots of time. So one thing nobody ever can assure and never in history of humankind has been able to assure is that every artist and creator gets paid for what they do. That's not like it works and it will not work in the future neither. So artists, and I studied applied textile art in my first life, so I'm not only talking from a second person's perspective here. But you never um, really made it a business. Hmm? But you never really made it a business, so you really no, only studied... No, the war fell and I studied <laughs> art in Germany, and then I went to a West German uh, labor agency to help me get the job, and then I told them I have a degree in textile applied art, yeah, that's, how, that's not how this business works. They told me in 1991, well before the internet, that I should reconsider and study something else in records, which I did. I studied international business because they said that. They said 3% of artists can live off their work. In 1991, well before the internet, I have to repeat that because it's so relevant. And now in the times of the internet, People try to tell me that all artists have to be able to live on their art, which is not going to happen. Who, who says oh, that? All, all I'm well, saying is... You know, hold on, there's a big difference, uh, hold on, there's a big difference between if you're question. making something that no one wants, no one buys it. If you're making something that people want, you have to get paid. I wrote a book, if you don't want to buy it, don't buy it. It does. For me, it does. Why it doesn't work with that? If you take my book, you have to pay me. That's the way it works. Let's stick to his question. His question was, um, I reformulate the question, we cannot ensure they earn money, but what ways are potentially there to earn money with art? And that's a very important question, because these ways may be different than the ways we had before. We need new business models and we need a legal system which makes these new business models possible. For example, I don't know whether you have heard of Humble Bundle. Humblebundle.com, you should remember that because it's a very nice thing. Um, they bundle things like online games and just until yesterday ebooks. A bundle of ebooks, something like 20 ebooks, something like that. And you could choose your price. You could pay 50 cents and get 20 ebooks. You could also pay $1,000 for it. And the surprise is there have been people paying 50 cents and there have been people paying $1,000. In two weeks, Humble Bundle sold ebooks, this one package, for $1.2 million. For something where everybody who bought that could choose freely what they paid for it. And they paid $1.2 million in two weeks. So there are people out there paying for stuff in. And now I call Kim.com. Four or five things are um, considered. First, you have the great product people want to have. Of course. Second, to bring it onto a platform people like to use. It's easy to use, people have it, can be Amazon, whatever. Third, for a price people are willing to pay. I mean, that's the market law, kind of not so new, is it? <laughs> and then, fourth, I'm not sure I remember all five, the fourth is you have to offer it in any format people want to use. And not with an e-book that you sell it for the Kindle, and if then, like with a paper book, you want to put it into another drawer or another room or another apartment you are not able to, you need to buy an entire new library for another reader to come transfer it, which is ridiculous. So have it on all formats, even if you pay for it just once. So you may want to read it on different platforms. And then remember the fifth. The fifth is make it available at the same point in time everywhere in the world. Do you know last year the 10 most legally 
downloaded movies online. None of them, zero, have been available for a legal online rental. Zero. So what are people meant to do if they just want to see this same thing? They have to download it somewhere. And they could also possible? choose to not They could also it. buy it. Or, or not, not confused not about it. It's not available. No, no, she said it wasn't available for rental. And they could confused about the way a market works. To use. Right, so that's the, the yeah. way a market works. So some, some of the you rights, German rights associations complain about DVD rental shops in the street lying out. Who the fuck wants to use these things anymore? Why do I have to leave my apartment and go to one of those shops? I want to use an online platform and I'm willing to pay a okay price for it. That does not even need to be one cent or ten cent. It could be five dollars or six, fine with me. I, I think Just, uh, one, one simple example. Harry Potter is so DRM free which means you can use it on every online platform. It's sold on Pottermore.com, the platform from J.K. Rowling. People love the product, a platform they like to use, it's that simple to use. An online copy costs $9, a price people seem to like, they download it like crazy, although it's available on every single file sharing platform in the world in any language they want. They buy it from this platform. And they can download it eight times, and they are even allowed by Pottermore.com to give this copy to friends and people they like. So this is well, what we want. That's Harry Potter's version. Does anyone think that, J that J.K. Rowling's Harry Potter book books succeeded because of this? I seem to recall them being popular in several other formats before this. I think you're confused. It's the first she said. Sure. No, no. I mean, even even when before she, she when back in the days when she still didn't leave her house, when Harry Potter was only available in bookstores, it was already a bestseller. And the popularity of Harry Potter may have very little to do with how it's offered, and more to do with the fact that people like the book. I think but they when, still like it. That's the point. Of course, they still like it. They still like it. No, no, no. When, listen, when you talk about a when you talk about a market. Look, I don't, I don't want to buy DVDs. When you talk about a market, as someone who's selling something, it's your right to sell it in the way you want for the price you want to sell it for. If someone says that price is, hold on, if someone says that price is too high, they shouldn't buy it. So last year, the most popular downloaded, I know you're really interested in access to knowledge, which is very important. So last year, the most popular download, the most popular illegal download was Fast Five. Has anyone seen it? Oh, you're cheating yourself of this access to knowledge that the internet makes possible. It's the fifth movie in the Fast and Furious franchise. I didn't see it either, don't worry. I feel kind of stupid defending their rights, but, um, you know, they have rights too. Um, think how many cars were destroyed for that movie. But people loved it. I mean, they loved it enough to download it. What? I thought you didn't watch the movie. How do you want to know how many cars were destroyed, or even if the cars were destroyed? I saw the preview. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Okay. They put all the money shots. But hold on. So Fast Five said, we're not going to rent the movie. We're going to sell it for, let's say, 10 euros. Now, you can say, 10 euros is too expensive. I don't want to see Fast Five. That's what I said. I wouldn't have seen it for free, but that's another story. You, you can say, I don't want to buy it. Rent another movie. See another movie. Take that's the market. The market is not, I'm going to steal it. Game of Thrones. Everybody knows Game of Thrones? Yeah. That's a series people want to look, although it's about rape all the time, so I don't like it so much. But you can't buy it legally. You can subscribe to a cable company and pay $100 every fucking month to see this one series you probably want to. You don't have a right to watch that series. How, How series? much do you, you know? Right? Oh, there's a, there's, wait, 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 there's no right for you to watch the You have no Game of Thrones costs $10 million an episode. You cannot buy the movie. You cannot buy the movie. You cannot buy the You cannot buy the movie. You cannot buy the movie. Before HBO. Okay, guys, guys. We have a lot. Okay, guys. It's not right. We have, we have a lot of topics to cover tonight. <laughs> I mean, we don't want to get bogged down in, into the copyright question. Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe uh, Rob and Jan, you just have some kind of closing remarks on this topic. Two to make a little to make a little to make a small closing statement on this. Um, our general assembly is coming in November. 
We'll have a couple of uh, proposals there for our program, for our party program, and for our um, election program for the federal election in 2030 next year. And there are some proposals out there for copyright too. And if you look at those, and uh, I'm sure we can get them available for you in English, you, yeah, you will see that there are uh, none of those uh, abolishment uh, proposals in there. It's very moderate. It's one thing that we are criticized for because uh, some people say we're not radical enough, but we have to understand one thing. We are in Germany and we can make proposals for copyright as, long as, uh, as, as much as we want, but we won't change it here because copyright is dealt with on the European level and we only have so much leverage here that we are kind of like, kind of don't have that elbow room that we would like to have. And so everybody that is saying we want to abolish copyright and make everything for, available for free for everybody, that's just a bogus claim, it's not true. So take a look at it, take a look at the text itself, it's very moderate. And I think that's the way we should go forward because otherwise we won't take the artists with us on our uh, travel to the promised land of digitalism. Um, so that's where we should go and I think we're in a good way now. Okay, Rob, you have one more thing you want to say? Okay. I want to switch to another, yeah, sure. bring up some other issues in a second. If you think about the traditional TV business, they never did anything like Game no, no. of Thrones. Mike. They never did anything like Game of Thrones because they didn't have that kind of budget. Game of Thrones cost $10 million an episode. Who does anyone remember John from Cincinnati? It was a big show on HBO that was very expensive. They canceled the, the West, what was the name of the Western show? West so Deadwood, they canceled Deadwood to do, thank you, to do John from Cincinnati. So, John from Cincinnati was extremely expensive. It flopped, they lost a lot of money. Game of Thrones doesn't only pay for Game of Thrones, it pays for the losses they suffered on John from Cincinnati. That's why HBO is a subscription business. They amortize their risk. Some things succeed, some things fail. You may not like that business model, but that's the business model that pays for Game of Thrones. And if you are suspicious of that business model, you should look at what's available on free TV. Because mostly, I'm not qualified to talk about German free TV. I don't, the only thing I understand is Vet and Das, and only a little bit of that. If you look at American free TV, and the free TV in Latin countries I understand, it mostly sucks. Pay TV and copyright gave us The Sopranos, Mad Men, Breaking Bad. It's not cool to say that, but Simpsons is free TV. Yeah, Simpsons is free. Simpsons is Fox. It's free. It's also it's also not that expensive. Okay. Okay, thanks, Rob. Um, <laughs> this is obviously a very heated debate here. I mean, obviously a passion topic a lot of people have a lot of passion about. But I wanted to move on to like one of the kind of central ideas um, that the pirates have been developing, I guess, especially in Berlin. And and then Fabrizio here hasn't had hadn't had much to say yet. Um, is more the topic of. Um, government 2.0, uh, liquid democracy. Maybe you can talk about your like direct experience in, in, in this field. Maybe explain to people who, who are not that familiar with, with the concepts, like what it's all about. Yeah, thank you. I think it's time because uh, we are really holding the cliche of copyrights, and that's not what the pirates are working on. Not only at least, it's much much go beyond it. And I think people who voted for the pirates in Berlin, they did not vote because of the the IT branch, the most of the people that came, came people that were not voting in Germany. There's a whole story here coming from the Weimar Republic that people are not going to vote, they're not that active. And the pirate comes with a proposal of participation, brought a liquid democracy, a way of cooperating over the internet with politics, but also show an alternative. Like you mentioned with politics 2.0, we are fully unsatisfied with the way politics are done. It's an outdated way. The way the coalitions are founding themselves, the way they are taking decisions is not more for the day of today. The people are not satisfied and the pilot will propose an alternative to it. And I will let the people who are more uh, fit in politics to go in depth on it. But from my daily experience in the pirates, we are organizing crews and squads in Berlin 
Every night you have a crew somewhere and there are people working. I was yesterday in the Abdiwarante House in the city parliament. Until 10 o'clock we were discussing uh, the case of 50 asyl appliances per day arriving in Berlin. 50 people arriving two blocks from here. There's a house, an emergency house hosting 160 people, 30 children without a school, without a doctors. They have not, they arrive and have only blankets and mattresses. And those are the shoes we are tackling daily. Those are like the, is the real things that we are having to face into politics. So there is a, a part that's right, we are kind of experts in the copyright uh, field, but that's not why people choose us, or the people are voting on us. It's a whole concept about how to do politics. And it comes with this sworn way of working. The, we have the crews that are social work that we have in each neighborhood. If you go over the internet, you see where they are. And you have the squads that are working oriented. And that's a way, I think if we talk a little bit how we got in these elections for last year, the other parties have agencies to put their posters on the road. And what happened here, the first day they should be putting their posters, it rained in Berlin. The pirates were there and put their posters where during the rain took the best places. We didn't to have people pay, pay to make our posters, we did it ourselves. So you have like an amazing group of maybe 200 people working hard in Berlin that got 10%, 9% of the votes. <coughs> and that makes a difference in politics. And it's making politics in a new way. The first petition that the party party made uh, in the parliament, the first speech from Pavel, he asked for the freedom inside of the fraction. Because at the moment the party, the parties in Germany, they vote on bloc. That means it doesn't matter which term it comes, if you're right or wrong, it's yes or no. And then comes to the pirates, some yes, some no. Hey, what is that? The other part is that people wonder how they are doing that, why they are doing that. So they give the freedom for the people to think by themselves and decide by themselves. So it's a fully different way of doing politics that the pirate party is proposing, is hacking into the politics. It's a new way of doing politics that comes to uh, participation of the citizen, using tools of the internet, but not only necessarily. Um, maybe Jan, um, you have a lot of, it seems like you have a lot of experience with the, um, the direct democracy software the pirates use, liquid uh, feedback. Um, there was a, a comment on the Explainer website yesterday and it said the um, liquid feedback software is about as user-friendly as going to the, the Bürgeramt. <laughs> is there, I mean, can you explain, like, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> can you explain, like, the principle of liquid feedback and, like, how, like, how it got developed, like, and how, you, how, like, a normal person can use it and, like, where it needs to go? Yeah, first of all, um, I think I have to point out that there are actually two things. Uh, one is a concept that is called uh, liquid democracy, if I already uh, mentioned it. And the other thing is uh, the software, which is not developed by the Pirate Party, but by a Berlin-based NGO, uh, public software group, and that software is called Liquid Feedback. That's the one but they're mentioned. very linked, aren't they? I mean, yeah, they were. I think it. some of them were members of the Pirate Party, but some of them actually resigned <laughs> from the Pirate Party, and uh, yeah, a lot members anymore. But those are the two, con the two things, the concept and the software. And you have to understand the concept in order to like, really get the software. Because um, as Fabiano pointed out, people are kind of... Fabrizio pointed out something. Uh, the, the people are kind of fed up with the fact that they don't really have a say anymore in political decisions. We've seen that all over Germany. People are protesting against big... Uh, public building uh, pro um, projects like the Stuttgart train station or the, um, the airport here in, uh, in Berlin and in uh, Frankfurt and Munich too. So they kind of feel left behind. And um, what we are proposing is a concept called liquid democracy. Liquid democracy is our vision for a comprehensive upgrade to uh, the democratic process and bringing it to the digital age. Um, and it makes us um, elements of uh, representative democracy with elements of direct uh, democracy. Because in representative democracy, you only vote, vote every four or five years. And you delegate your, your vote to someone and you can't take it back. So, you, you delegate your vote for four years. Uh, and 
it also comes with the benefit that you don't have to think about what your like your your, your stand on this uh, specific uh, issue is. So you kind of get something back because you don't have to think about it anymore. Um, because it's, when it's very detailed, you don't want to really like, think about it. Um, with direct democracy, you have to think about every issue that comes up on the table, like in uh, Switzerland, for example. Now, what liquid democracy does is we mix it up. You can delegate your vote to someone, but you can revoke that delegation any time. So, for example, there's a, there's a federal election coming up, so you're voting for an, an MP of the Pirate Party, maybe, or for, from the Conservative Party or the Social Democrats. So you delegate your vote. But after two years, an issue comes up. For example, on uh, like Medicare, for example. You're very interested in that. You say, okay, I want to I wanna do this issue myself. I'm so interested in this because, for example, your, your father or your mother is very ill and it's um, has, has to be taken care of in a hospital. I say, no, that's important, I want to do this myself. And you revoke your delegation and you specifically deal with this issue yourself and you vote yourself. So you have all the benefits of delegation, but you also have the benefits of direct democracy when you want it. So that's our proposal and we think it redeems the core aspiration of democracy. You can vote whenever you want, wherever you want and on whatever you want. So it's a very comprehensive um, concept. And now comes the connection to, uh, to the software. We're applying these principles in our inner party decision-making process through the uh, liquid feedback software. Because in there you can vote based on delegation, you can vote yourself, you can delegate, it's for example, energy policy. Or you can just set a global delegation to someone like Uncle, for this year or me, whatever you want to. Okay, okay, can I have one, one question just to clarify? This is happening within the party, right? Yes. Exactly. Like, do you want to transfer this concept to like society as a whole? Yes, it's already Just to add something in the, another context that brings me very much to the party party, to the international context. We are having communication, there are party parts that are sitting in other spaces, and I have a vision, I have a wish that this kind of way you break borders. Like we have two petitions that I work on here in Germany that have to do with Brazil. I just mentioned one an example. It's being constructed, it's planned to construct an atomic uh, nuclear plant in Brazil. That's forbidden in Germany. There's a technology that's risky, it's forbidden here. It will be constructed with financial support from Germany. So the pirates from Germany said, we don't agree with it. We have contacts with pirates in Brazil who are discussing it there. And you can envision something like a big democracy where citizens from different countries can vote on the same issue. Let's say we buy rice by a supermarket here that's every time cheaper. There's a farmer in Bangladesh or in India getting less money so that you can have a cheaper rice here. Let's them voice their opinion on the other side about it. So this kind of is a future of politics where the country loses its power, the powers go back to the people because they have the voice, they have the opportunity to go over the internet and say what's right for them. And that's a part, that's a, something new, it's a new flavor that liquid democracy as a concept has a tool, liquid feedback here, there are other tools. But the Pirate Party is using that, in Munich they are using another, but the Italian Pirate Party is also using liquid feedback. Brazil has used it. So it doesn't matter if the Pirate Party will be the name. We also say we hope you will be useless in the future, it will be superficial, that the other parties will learn and take over those concepts. The interest is not to take the power as a party, but to share, to spread the power to the people. And how far can you take like, direct democracy and, and, and liquid feedback? I mean, if you get like thousands and millions of people like voting online with this stuff, I mean, is, I mean, there's a, is there a limit to it? Like, can you, can it just end? I mean, often the pirates are accused of being chaotic. I mean, maybe too much liquid feedback would just end up in kind of anarchy. Would that be bad? <laughs> you see what's happening now with the Greek case there? Germany decided that people from Germany are against to give this head of help there, when you ask the citizen. The government is, has to give the help, otherwise the economy doesn't run. So the Greeks say, get out of here, Germans, with their, your rules. We don't want it. The Germans don't want it. They still give the money. The Greek has to cut their salaries there, and the stock markets go up. 
which world is this? What's the nonsense that's going on? How, how is that? Is that a solution? They don't have a solution there. So I don't know, I don't see the party party who can do better, we don't have a solution. But the whole movement Occupy is not for nothing there. I see lots of a resonance there. The situation as it is is not it's far away from something we should. In this way we, we, we don't have a solution. That's also that we put it in campaign last year. We are the ones with the questions. You have to have the answers. I'd, yeah, I'd like to add to this Euro topic is always quoted uh, also by journalists of all kinds who ask us. And whenever a journalist asks me, what is your, in brackets, Pirate Party golden solution to solve world's problems in the Euro crisis, I usually ask back, do you know any other party having a great solution for the Euro crisis? <laughs> I have never met someone. Not even Chancellor Merkel can explain the problem and the solution. She cannot, she does not. She may be able to, but she is not doing it. So if problems are really big and complex, and you want to have more people participate in political decision making, the first thing politics have to do is explain better. And they don't do it. So now, under this bad information situation, of course you cannot go and ask 80 million Germans what they, how they want to solve the crisis because they don't understand the problem. But you have first, and that's why these aspects of open government are so closely linked together, you have to first inform the people. You need a total transparency on what's happening. What are the details of the, it's actually a banking crisis, not a euro crisis, yeah? Banks failed. They did a bad capitalist business job. <coughs> I studied international business, so theoretically, uh, the invisible hand of the market is great, it doesn't always write it, it doesn't do it in reality. So those banks failed in their current system. And we try to save them somehow. We don't save the people. So first thing we have to do is inform about these interactions between banks, how does it work, how they earn their money, how do they socialize, um, the negative profits they make, so what the losses are socialized, but privatized is always the profit. So people have to understand this, and then you have to explain possible measures and solutions, so that people have an opportunity to be able to judge on that. And that's not happening either, so without changing the basis of transparency and information, you cannot extend the system of participation. But I wanted to give that sounds so pessimistic. I want, I want also to give a very great example of today's politics where liquid democracy uses new tools to just find better ways of interacting with people and have they all take part in politics. And that happened in the state of Hamburg with the transparency law. The state of Hamburg was a bit like the state of Berlin. How do I say that politely? Politicians have very long standing, usually old boys relationships, and everybody helps everybody else, and never somebody pisses on somebody else's leg, so to say. Well, that's the same in Hubble. So everything is covered up. And people wanted to politics become more transparent. See where corruption takes place or prevent it from happening. Have the contracts open where governments buy stuff with our taxpayers' money. Make it open. <coughs> but the government didn't do it. So somebody opened up a wiki, like Wikipedia, a public open wiki, usable for everybody, every citizen, even in Singapore, who write in it. And they wrote a law in a public wiki. Citizens wrote a law. It sounds totally crazy, but even ex um, court members of the German Constitutional Court took part in writing this. And those experts make sure that it had really high quality, that law. And then they collected signatures for an official citizen participation process. And they got the first uh, threshold, the necessary number of signatures they had to collect. So that forced the Hamburg government to go into the second stage of um, citizen participation. And the second stage would have been several months later and have two possible uh, process outcomes. First, they adopt the law as it is, which they didn't want to do at that point in time. Second, the citizens get the final decision in a public voting. And that would have happened this very summer, this year. 
So the Pirate Party, the Greens, the left, many NGOs, they prepared for a really hot lobby summer to make this transparency law written in the public wiki a success for the people. And then all of a sudden, the government of the state of Hamburg realized, oh my god, they could get really the public a successful vote on that. And that is when they started to negotiate with the citizen initiatives all together. And within something like five, six weeks negotiation, they agreed and anonymously adopted this very wiki law. First time ever in the world, a law written by the people. And it's now in place. And the mayor of Hamburg went to the press and said, we are so proud, we the government of the state of Hamburg, we are the most transparent city in all Germany, which is great. He did it. I don't mind. Now the state of Berlin, in records, the citizens of the state of Berlin, and many, many other cities in Germany have a precedence case, and they say, we want the same law. If they have all contracts published, and I can see what they buy from whom for what kind of money. We want to have exactly the same here. We don't have the water contracts had public in Germany. We have the, the whole catastrophe with the Berlin airport, etc. 95% of the documents concerning the airport, the, the big one, the failure one, they are not public. They are confidential. 95% of those documents, how can that be? And this is something where you rightly said, we want to change that, we want to change how politics does take place. And that's a major change. No other party can do that right now. I was just going to say, you know, I think this is great. In a way, in some ways it sounds less futuristic. It sounds more like Athenian democracy than futuristic democracy. That's not a criticism, it's just a, it's just a point. Um, you know, I don't think that's a bad thing. Um, I guess my only worry would be that in some ways I think that, you know, the two most direct democracies on the planet, and I know this isn't just direct democracy, the two most direct democracies on the planet that I can think of are California and Switzerland. Um, I don't know much about Switzerland because they sort of operate in three languages that I don't know, um, <laughs> rather than just one. But California, you know, they, they have these propositions. So basically, the, the citizens of California got together and voted on a proposition that they didn't want their taxes to go up because most people, you know, raise your hand if you want your taxes to go up. Yeah, that's what usually happens. And um, as a result, the state of California is basically the Greece of the U.S. Um, the weather's lovely, and the government is broke. Oh, you know, I'm, I'm, Switzerland's never broke. I don't, I, I'm just, my, my point is that I think there may be... Um, I, I guess what I, what I worry about is I think that it's great to make things more participatory. I guess that my worry is that some of the bad decisions that politicians seem to make, citizens sometimes seem to make a lot of the same ones. Like, um, you know, when everyone thought that the economy was going up, 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 countries borrowed a lot of money, cities borrowed a lot of money, states borrowed a lot of money, banks borrowed a lot of money. Ordinary people borrowed way too much money, too. So I, I think this is all fantastic, and I'm not criticizing it. I think it's really important, but I wonder whether it will um, solve problems or move them around. But that's not a reason not to do it. I think it's a great, it's a great thing. Isn't it about explaining the questions that you ask to the people? Yeah. Rather, because of course the politicians have got the expertise, but if you want people to vote, isn't it about actually explaining what you're voting for? Well, I'm, I'm from a country where explaining what you're voting for has become like a multi-billion dollar industry, right? I mean, but know, it's their job. Yeah, but no, no, so, but you get to, you know, but if, if you look at the U.S. for a second, I mean, we have. We're at an election where, like, basically, there's a guy who said, you know, one guy says, I don't want to, you know, I want to lower taxes on people who make less than $250,000 a year. And the other guy says, I want to help people who are making more than $250,000 a year. Not that many people make $250,000 a year. And yet, it's a neck and neck election. Can you explain this? I can't. The implementation of liquid democracy, it's in the future. And we can do this now. And I personally, because you asked, are we just moving problems around? Uh, of course, the, the, the representative system is flawed, as you pointed out. We have uh, 
um, uh, asymmetrical power distribution, money is a big problem. But I'm not afraid of people casting their vote. I'm not afraid of people making their own decisions. That's one thing why I came to the Pirate Party, because I really think that democracy is a good thing. It should be implemented. It should, of course, be tempered, but it should not be tempered by a small circle of elites making our decisions. I want to decide myself. Where do you want togas? I want what? Togas? No, I want them in fraternity. So. Uh, no, no. The Athenian thing. Sorry, never mind. The yeah. Athenian thing. Okay, the Athenian thing. Sorry, one thing. Of course, they were free and unfree people and it kind of got out of hand and they voted for war in Sparta and it didn't really work out. <laughs> but, uh, let's leave out the war thing and then it kind of fits. Another thing is how politics are done. If you talk about the U.S., which kind of option in a country where you have two parties, and what's one of the things the pirates fight here is to remove the limit that you can have more parties, more plurality inside of the parliament. And then from the experience very practical that we are having in Berlin, we have four parties that were putting in their program that they wanted the rights for voting for the foreigners in Berlin. Four parties, the left, the pirates, the Green and the SPD. The SPD make a coalition with the CDU, the only one that didn't want it. Now they are in this coalition of power. So Berlin is against the voters' rights for foreigners. Although, from the voting of the people from Berlin, over 70% of the people from Berlin vote in parties that have in their program the rights of voting for foreigners. But what happened in this politics of this coalition? The representant, the representant comes from res, from the Latin. The res means the object that's being discussed is lost because only the rest from the representant itself is being considered who is exerting the politics. And that becomes a new, a, a new field, object-oriented democracy. It goes beyond the leak of democracy that's called what's being discussing? What are you taking decisions for? And the people should be interested in it. The people should be interested in going the team and not to have a very but it's a shame in the US, the political system of two parties is a joke. Okay, it's years. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that. I don't know that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a gentleman here. Hi. Um, I just a question. Um, uh, with the, the power party, um, if, uh, if they're voting in parliament, will they be voting in line with uh, the, the views of the population? Will they be using liquid democracy to, to cast their votes in the parliament? That's a good question, and in fact, yes, that's the way we implement it here in Berlin. We have our liquid uh, feedback software, um, and we actually have um, put some little clauses into our Articles of Constitution, I think that's what it's called for, for the party, um, that decisions made through the liquid feedback system have to be implemented. And the way it works here is, Maybe you would like become a party member, then you get access to that software platform, you draft a text in a collaborative way with your peers, put it in there, people vote on it, people comment on it, you, tune the, you do a little fine tuning, maybe throw sort of something out, put some, some new yeah, stuff you in. You have to be in the party. Yeah, you have to be in the party. Yeah. Well, why, why not just let everybody participate? <laughs> There are people that think about that, expand with that, yeah. But right now, it's not this way. And now, actually, we have a member here. Yeah, and what happens is, if this pro proposal by you gets voted positively, then it will get passed to the parliamentary group, and the, par the members of parliament, of the private party, in their assembly, vote on that proposal. And, okay, if, if your proposal is kind of weird, and only gets like 50% plus one of the votes, yeah, there might be discussion about it, and they might say, okay, go back to the text, think about it, make it better. But if it has like 93% positive vote, there's no reason why they wouldn't like, implement it. So that, that, that's one of the things that the media doesn't really point out with regard to the pirates in Berlin. Because we are the only party that has a direct bridge from the parliamentary group to the basis of the party. And that, that line of communication is open, and every party member can get their proposals through the parliamentary group. Would it not be better if um, you just did exactly what you were told to do instead of... No, that's not allowed by law, because that okay. would mean that uh, you would have an uh, imperative mandate, and that's forbidden by our constitution. So you always have to have them vote on it. 
But so you're not allowed to have a liquid democracy? Yeah. No, no, that's not the, no, that's not. So there wouldn't be a liquid democracy if they would do what the liquid feedback system says. Liquid democracy would be that the parliament would work this way, that you had representatives there, we have delegations, and we would have is, people is who vote themselves. Up for corruption? Like, surely it should just be a machine. Yeah, what well, could be more corrupt than the current system? Come on, give but, me a break. No, but seriously, <laughs> that's, that's the question I have too. How do you protect against voter fraud and, and, and technical and manipulation? There's a huge discussion. There's a discussion about that because some people say, oh, we should publish all the names, we should only be allowed to use real names. Others say, oh, we should use pseudonyms. Others say we should use it anonymously. That is a discussion. How do you do it now? How do you know now? Now, now it works this way. You get an access code, and then you are in the system, and you can vote. But the problem is there are some people who like uh, get an access code. They are member of a party for one year, then they drop out, and then they can vote maybe for one month or two months longer than they're actually a member. So it's kind of tricky. But we're not saying this is the perfect way. We're just saying, okay, this is a new, a new uh, way of thinking about politics, a new way of rethinking platform, uh, politics as a platform that everyone should have access to, because that's like what we want. And we're fine-tuning this, and we're having this internal discussion on making it better. So uh, we are not tempering this discussion that you just mentioned. We're yeah. actively engaging. And, and how about I think, I think we actually have, have a, 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 a real-life uh, <laughs> pirate member of the Berlin Parliament here. Maybe you could uh, share member? your thoughts on this. So, yeah. Hi, first. Um, the thing is, um, <laughs> there are a few issues. Um, oh, it's not yeah, it's not working. So. I still, uh, I just tried to be loud for I might switch it on. Yeah, that might work. Try switching on. I tried switching it off and on again. Okay, not great. Great. Um, the thing is, um, we actually do this both ways. So, if there is a winning uh, 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 um, proposal in the liquid feedback system, we try putting this into the parliament. Um, we might decide that it's not the opportune time for a specific uh, proposal at that specific time. But we always try putting them into the legislative process. But it also works the other way around. If there is a proposal from another party, we uh, give that back to our liquid feedback system for our uh, party members to vote on. And that de uh, um, decides how we, uh, uh, how we uh, um, vote on that. Uh, uh, proposal in Parliament. There are two things about that. First thing, the Berlin Constitution guarantees the parliamentarians uh, uh, to be bound only by their conscience. That's, um, that has a reason, because uh, nobody should be forced by their party to uh, make specific uh, votes. That's also important and that's why uh, there are no sanctions if you don't do that. But most of the time, actually in all cases up to now, we actually did that, what uh, uh, Liquid Feedback told us. So it's basically we are RC toys controlled by our members of the party. And then the question is why only members of the party? There's a big problem with uh, uh, letting everybody in, which is uh, something we would like to do, but aren't able to because uh, we need to know that every person only has one account on that. We don't want Bayer Schering or Mafei Kraus Wegner to have uh, uh, thousands of accounts. Um, so in, in, in a general election, we're, we're able to make sure everyone votes once, so it's possible. Yeah, the thing is, in a general election, uh, there, is a, uh, uh, there is a public office uh, controlling that everybody only gets one uh, certificate for voting. But uh, we, don't have, uh, uh, we, don't have the, uh, um, we don't have the database of all citizens in the party. So we can, we can check that. We are trying uh, uh, in uh, certain districts to implement a system where every citizen can vote. But that means that if you want to be part of the system, you have to go to uh, um, a specific place at a specific time and present to the people there your passport or your identity card uh, to prove that uh, you aren't on the system yet. That's a very big 
um, administrative overhead at the moment. Um, what we want to implement is that a system like that is implemented uh, by the public offices so that it's open for all the citizens but it has the protection that everybody gets exactly one account. But uh, that's a big stretch because um, our constitution in Germany and also in Berlin is um, basically um, very much <coughs> very much influenced by the idea of parliamentarism. And it's a very long way to get away from that into a liquid democracy. But that's what we set out to do, and that's what we are trying to do, but it, won't, it will take some time. How, <laughs> it how, do, you, yeah. Yeah. how do you deal with uh, privacy and, and like, uh, confidentiality? Well, that's a discussion we are uh, having, and very strongly so, for the last two years. Right. Yeah, yeah, can you tell us something? Yeah. I'm really interested. What are the thoughts that are going on? That's a, that's a, a philosophic debate, basically. Does liquid feedback mean <laughs> that every citizen becomes a politician? Because for politicians it's very normal to be associated with their votes. Or should every citizen just stay a citizen and um, uh, have the right to vote anonymously, as it is at the moment. I think most people will just want to entrust their vote to someone that they, they, they like. You know, most people will want to vote. Yeah, of course. If, if we had a, a liquid democracy system implemented, um, th that possibility would appear. I mean, th that's what uh, uh, Jan told you before. If you have a liquid democracy system and say, well, I'm just a voter, I don't care too much about things that happen, I don't have too much time, I just delegate my vote to somebody. That is something that a liquid democracy system would allow you to do. Um, the basis democracy which, uh, for example, Switzerland has, doesn't allow you to do that. I mean, yeah, there is a parliament, but whenever there's a specific topic uh, that gets into public vote, you have to have an opinion on it. Or you just have to uh, 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 open your mailbox, take out the letter from your preferred party and see what they suggest you to vote. This thing can be hacked, but if you can see, uh, yeah. if you have the possibility to see who voted on what, you can just recalculate the result to see if it's right or if it isn't. And uh, you can ask the people, did you really vote this on that topic? The, if the possibility exists, it's quite secure. Yeah. But if the possibility doesn't exist, if it, there's only, uh, uh, in the end, there's only re the result, uh, X people voted uh, yes, uh, Y people voted no, there's no way to know whether that's really the correct result or whether that has been hacked by someone. I'd right just like to say add something for Simon, Simon what he's saying. Thank you for explaining so well. But this is a theme that I see since two years here. Whole weekend's conference with one question like this. Like I see over 20 hours only for this question. All the time. So this central question. I, 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 I welcome that here. I'd like to make an advertise for the parts in Berlin. There is an English-speaking group. Here there is some flyers. If someone would like to go deeper or see how it works really inside the party, you can take one the flyer. And there is the connection every two weeks. There is a meeting in English from the parts in Berlin. Um, I, want, I wanted to bring, I mean, kind of bring up the idea of like, well, how, where, where are the pirates going? Um, like there was this big kind of, uh, last year there was a big spike um, in the surveys and so on. And now you have the feeling that a lot of the mainstream media have already kind of written off the pirates because the surveys have gone down to 6% or something. I mean, how, how important is it for the pirates to, to, to get to gain power, how important is it for the pirates to gain power so they can influence and change the system? I mean, what's more important, getting more pirates in the parliament or just spreading your ideas? Anke, I know you actually hope to run for the Bundestag for the pirates, and you find out pretty soon, right? So. If you want to change a system, I believe you have to hack it. To hack it, you have to break into it. And since breaking in in the narrow sense of the word is no option, um, we want to break into it in a legal way. And that means we have to get the necessary share of vote to be a part of it, to lift the other type of policy which has already been explained 
And even if the rules are not changed, for example, become the most transparent members of parliaments we've ever had in Germany, with everybody publishing all their side incomes, all lobbyist meetings, etc., which is what we want the rules to be changed into, where we can start living it ourselves, and that's why we have to be in there to show it's possible at all. We can also show that it's possible to involve citizens in many, many various ways of political decision making. But we have to be in this parliament to be able to do this. And I'm not worried at all um, that the polls go down first, it's a year to go, and a year is a long time. We are really strong in campaigning. We are great campaigners. We are lousy when the next election is too far away because then we start to deal with ourselves too much. It's not such a good idea. <laughs> so when we have a big challenge ahead of us, believe me, it will be a great campaign and we will we will beat the polls again. Um, media just likes writing people up and down, so no, we don't really care. Now that I have you on the mic, Anke, um, you a big a big issue in the media was um, the lack of women in the Pirate Party. Um, it had this image uh, of being a sort of party of hackers, computer nerds, male, male mostly. Um, and I, I, you yourself um, are a self-proclaimed feminist. Um, and you switched from the Greens to Pirate Party. So, I mean, how do you see it? Like, uh, why, why did you switch from the Greens? Where, where the Greens are a lot more women, they, they seem to be much more obviously active in promoting women. How, how, what's it? Not really. I have a high interest in women, but that's not my only interest. Whatever. You know what I mean. I know what it is. I'm actually married to Jane. No, 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 I know. I'm not saying it has to be. Yes, um, well, actually, Oh yeah, I got Be my sexist. husband from somewhere Thank else, you. not from within the Pirate Party. Seriously. Um, I would have come earlier from the Greens to the Pirate Party had they had more women and had they not had that kind of sexist image. And I was, so I was for years preaching and missionarying about open oh, government is great, let's make policy, transparent, so Every so often, pirate party members came to me and said, you talk like a pirate, why are you not a pirate? Come to our party. And my regular answer was, well, you know, I'm male people there. I would not feel at home with a place where it's 95% men. Or I always hear those sexist stuff. And once, one of those guys told me, you know what? If every single woman we want to join our party replies like you, that will never change. <laughs> and he kind of got me. And that's when I thought, okay, I am for new energy, Greens do it, and now even Angela Merkel wants the change. Done. I'm a feminist, the Greens are full of feminists, they don't need me, need me there for that. <laughs> I want open government to happen, I believed in the Greens to do that. They won in the parliamentary election in the state of North rhine westphalia two and a half years ago. They had the greatest coalition contract I've ever seen in terms of open government. It was amazing and I was having it in all my presentations on open government. Great example, best practice. After a year I stopped doing it because it didn't happen. It was paper. And it stayed paper. And that was when I was losing faith in, in the Greens on the one side and actually recognizing the argument that if I don't like it to be a male party, I have to start changing it and bring as many women as I can with me and change it from the inside. And they need my feminist expertise much more than the Greens. They are already enlightened. Male parents don't want to hear this right now. Um, on the other hand, I've never, not even in the Green Party, met so many male feminists like the Pirate Party. They have more on both sides of the extreme, so to say, and that gives me hope. And there is also one very important thing. There is in the, I always call it the pirate DNA, there is one very strong thing in the pirate DNA, and that's equality and anti-discrimination. For whatever reason, 
for whom you like to laugh or how many you like to laugh, <laughs> where you come from, what your social background is, what your educational background is, what your age is, and what your gender is. So if sometimes some male pirates don't get it right as to my personal judgment. It's not because they want to discriminate women, don't like women or whatever. It's because they think they are so equal that gender doesn't matter at all and they simply don't know many of the facts I do know because I dealt with the topic for more than 10 years. So I read all the international research, the German studies, etc. I know the numbers and the figures, I did the research. For a I while they were calling themselves post Post yeah, but that's over. I mean, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, that, that's explaining it. Something like a year ago, actually it was a journalist suggesting that Trump and Harris took it over. They said, gender does not matter because we are anti this door anyway, which there is probably, not probably, there is 100% more than just male and female. There are squirrels, for example. <laughs> That's the extra draw with everybody else who is not considering themselves a male and female, the so called squirrel in the parallel party. Squirrel, yes, bought one today for the Christmas tree. Yeah. Squirrel. Um, so we, we don't want this black and white anyway, and that is why many pirates a year ago said we, we don't like this gender thing. We are post gender. And that's why we, even if somebody joins the party, don't even ask the gender. So no party member could honestly say how how high is the percentage of women because we don't have it on the database. We can estimate it's something like 50% more or less, or we, maybe 20. Yeah, nobody knows. How do you sure. estimate it? It's yeah, we know. Place. Well, you look at assemblies <laughs> and things. Names, names have no places gender attached. Like, what we don't know. But in the last year, something really changed because we had lots of debates within the party. Every single time when there are lists made up for the next elections so or board members voted upon and it appears to be very male dominated, sometimes even 100% male, we always have a very hot debate going on. And this debate is how to change it. Why is it like this? Is it the frequent shitstorms we have on our some of our electronic channels, which is probably pushing away women, but at the same time pushing away men who are not so Teflon covered and probably not so, I don't know, Rampensau in English. But, you know, the more sensitive people, they are pushed away by these things as well. So what we discuss, we do a whole weekend conferences on how to change the communication style within the party. So I, I believe in change, farther change happening there. I saw a lot of change happening in the last 12 months. And we will work on more change to happening. The future of the Pirate Party, the problem is that um, we have kind of two factions in our party and we are just now beginning to realize that um, it's not just about hacking the system or um, providing a new operating system for the um, democratic process as our former party whip Marina Weisband once said. Um, the problem is that we also need to come up with um, the policy issues and have to provide answers to questions that the citizens come up with and ask us because they might not understand the concept of liquid democracy because it's kind of complicated. They want direct answers and we're now realizing that we have to cater to both these uh, approaches or demands and it's a very painful process because we want to talk about liquid democracy, we want to talk about transparency, we want to talk about policy as, uh, politics as an open platform, but every time the media approaches us, they want to talk about what we call heads, talking heads. They want to have certain figures that they can talk to that are kind of a rampensau, as uh, uh, she just, just said, and they want to have answers, for example, the Euro crisis. What do you uh, think about the Euro crisis? What is your economic policy? What do you uh, say about um, renewable energies. The problem is that right now we don't have 
many answers in our program and we really need our next General Assembly to fill the, uh, the blank holes in our program to be able to reach those people that are not as interested as we are in a hacked system of democracy. We need to also cater to those other people. We really need to get those two approaches together and um, unify it. That's the problem. Because otherwise, I'm really afraid that we might not be able to enter parliament. And, and as um, you just said, um, we can only change the system from inside. And we really didn't achieve anything if we don't make it to the parliaments. Because in the end, that's where the decisions are made. For example, for election reforms, that's the problem. It's kind of a snake that bites its tail. If, if I might score partially, I do think we have to go to the meeting and tell it to the program, but we have the program, a program in the last election. The press keeps saying that the pilot has no program. Oh my God, it's printed and it's all over, and the press keeps saying the pilots have no program. I don't know which echo they keep the propagating, but I think as if you want to change it, a paradigm of change in the politics, you don't have to come with solutions in the program, red and product that we should talk uh, as a part of the future, we want to change the way politics is done and not come with single solutions there. You know, it's a way to combine. But the problem is... I would add that actually asking the people to bring the solutions yeah. is in itself already a solution in a way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but the problem is, the problem is that, of course, we have a program. And we had a good program in 2009. That's undisputed. But the problem is that, as I have like had this experience, that we're not able to reach people which, who otherwise would be interested in our like uh, core values because they are kind of, we kind of exclude them by not having certain uh, policy fields covered. And I'm not saying we should provide them with different solutions, but we should at least tell them how we would approach certain issues. For example, how do we approach the transformation um, of the energy economy? What is our approach to renewable energies? What is our approach to economics itself? Because one of our uh, demands is, for example, net neutrality. How does the principle of net neutrality apply to economics? So we're not giving them solutions, but we're giving them new ways of thinking about certain policy fields. That's what we should tackle um, individual policy fields so that people are, get, are, are drawn into our uh, program and are drawn into this concept of being a pirate, of this concept of open platforms, being a part, being a, rep, uh, a responsible uh, citizen that can make educated decisions himself and not rely on the state or giving everything to the free markets. Is, is it appropriate to have policy if you're supposed to be doing what people say? You know, if, if, if it's liquid democracy, is it appropriate for you to say, oh, we think this is the right direction to go? Yeah, well, liquid democracy is 25 years away. <laughs> okay. So um, we, need to, we need to have answers now. And when we say, okay, we want to have participation uh, we want to have um, economics as a platform that everybody can contribute to either by being employed or by being a founder or by being a VC. So, so what happens if you say we're going to vote this way on this issue and then whenever it comes to make that vote do you ask the party and then they say no we, we want you to vote a different way? Well we're not asking <coughs> We'd the, whole, the whole package all the time because we have a party program which gives us kind of like cornerstones and then we talk about how, okay, what, what kind of leverage weight does it give us? How much elbow room do we have? And then, okay, what can we do with this elbow room? Where can we go? Can we go more to the, for example, to the economics, more towards free market economics, not totally free market economics, but more self-responsibility or more um, interventions by the state. So it gives us a little room and then we can ask the next question, okay, what do we do there? So it's not the whole question all the time. Um, actually, that's interesting that you brought up the economic issue, I mean, because a, a lot of people have trouble um, locating the pirate party on the political spectrum. Like, are they left-wing? Are they liberal? Are they libertarian? Like, what are they? Like, or are you 
like thinking outside of the box, or like, well, how do you sell it to the people who need to think of these kind of words? Actually, I'm one of the authors of um, a proposal for economic policy for the um, General Assembly. And what I did, it's because what, what I just said is drawn from that. What I did was, and uh, two other authors, um, we, 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 took a look, we took a look at, okay, how do we approach policy in general? This open platform approach. How can we apply that to economics? And what we did was we, 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 we were drawing a, a proposal that is kind of just setting the cornerstones. Okay, let's take a look at how we um, approach uh, property, for example. What is our what is our approach towards property? What, what's our thinking? How do we see property? Intellectual property is one part, but are there forms where you have uh, collaboration or where, where you have uh, goods that more people than one can use? What, what kind of, um, how, well, how do we value those? What is, what is the approach of the state regarding taxes? Because we think we should answer those questions before we give answers to the euro crisis, for example. We have to clear that out first. And there are, I think, four or five uh, proposals regarding economic policy. Some are very left-wing, some are kind of free market approaches. Uh, and we really have to see what, in the end, gets voted at the General Assembly. I think it will be really a decision uh, that will set the course for the next two, three years. So it's very, it is very important that we think about this, that we have a really long debate on this. Uh, and not force this through, it would be kind of interesting. So keep your eyes open in the press because I think that would be the thing that the press will report on. Having, if there's anyone I fail to offend, I'll, I'll just jump, <laughs> jump in that now. See if this happens. So, I, you know, one of the things that strikes me as interesting is that the Pirate Party is thought of, and I, I don't read that much the German press, so I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, is generally thought of as more toward the left, more toward the Greens. But if you think about, and I'm, I'm sort of stepping back from a philosophical point of view, I think of it as more of a libertarian perspective. If you think about, you know, an emphasis on freedom and rights, and even, you know, when people applauded for anarchy, that, to me, is the kind of philosophy that I associate with libertarianism and the right. I don't mean the CDU, I mean philosophically. Um, when I think about myself as someone who leans more toward the left, I think about um, more intervention in the market, more enforcement of what I call positive rights. You know, that I have you know, the right to my work or the right to a minimum income, which I know you, or minimum income, minimum um, food med, level of food and medicine, which I know you do support. But when you talk, but the Pirate Party, I think, talks a lot about freedom from things. Freedom from surveillance, freedom from these kinds of um, contracts for intellectual property that some of our society runs on. I think of that as much more of a libertarian approach. Um, whether or not that's a good thing is a whole other sort of thing, but I think of it much more philosophically on the right than on the left. I, I don't mean just to be clear, I don't mean Republicans or CDU, I mean in terms of f freedom, what you support more is freedom from than freedom for. In, in some sense, yeah. Uh, I think if, if you're uh, embracing piracy, that could really just seem to be more of a right wing policy. That's, that's like the ultimate free market. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, no, no, no. very much. In, in a sense, piracy is essentially, if you think about what you're sort of, if you think about copyright. Leave aside the unlikable corporations. I know they're unlikable. If you think about it, the piracy is sort of the free market without laws. It's sort of like having a free market without a minimum wage. Minimum wage raises the cost of goods. You may support the minimum wage, but you always want things cheaper. Minimum wage raises the cost no, of goods. No, we don't want always things cheaper. Rate, rate, what? We don't oh, want I mean, I mean, cheaper. most. We are, I don't mean aware you. About our consumer I, don't mean, user I don't mean you. I mean most rational actor, most people, consumers, rational actors want things cheaper. When you talk about minimum wage, it raises the cost of goods. Copyright also raises the cost of goods. So I do, I, I, I agree with you. I mean, I see copyright has traditionally been a progressive notion. I don't mean, sorry, I shouldn't drag it back to it. I'll shut up now. I just would like to ask a question. If the normal consumer wants it cheaper because it's 
bad informant. You see the movements, even if I am not a fan of fair trade or B, but if you see those movements are not for nothing. People are getting aware that something good and fair has a cost. And but I would like to go back to the left or right question. I think in a change of paradigm that's fully the wrong perspective. I come from innovation management before I was an executive by Bayerstoff in Germany, it was my history. And if you want something new, don't start to look only what's coming behind you, what was the past. We are not talking about the left or right. The, the question, well, the five parties considered left or right is kind of tricky because we have positions where we have where we really call for status intervention. For example, the unconditional basic income is a, is clearly a left concept. And minimum wage as a bridge technology towards um, 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 unconditional basic income. That's a clearly a left concept. But we've also other state organizations of our party, especially from southern Germany, that are not as left as the Berlin state organization, which is kind of tricky because at the General Assembly we'll have to find a position that is like in between somewhere. Um, so it's kind of a challenge. But um, we also have positions that are more or less uh, libertarian. For example, the whole non invention, uh, the whole data protection issue, the basic rights. Um, issue. I would call those more libertarian or liberal, but uh, I don't think we can consider the Pine Party left party or right party because it's always a mixture. That's one thing that makes it really hard for our chairman, Bert Schlömer, to answer questions from journalists because they're all, always asking, okay, are the Pine Party, Party left or right? And he has a kind of a tricky time answering that because when he says, okay, we are left party, the uh, um, Berlin State Organization will applaud. But people from Bavaria or Baden-Württemberg the probably won't applaud. If he says, no, we're not a left party, um, we in Berlin are pretty angry at him. So it's kind of like a, he's, he's walking on the knife's edge here. And I think we will either have to position us, I hope more on the left side, or we really have to keep this open when as long as we can. Three pirates and three opinion. Um, actually, I'm going to close over the so, um, I said three pirates, three opinions. Sometimes that can happen. But I'm a bit more with Fabrizio. I think the concepts of right or left just don't fit our times anymore, and even less so in the future. And what differentiates the pirate party, most of other parties, is that I personally perceive it to be the only party which looks at how does society has to change we fit in a digital society, which is there and it's even more coming. And that refers to national borders, do they make any sense anymore? National legal systems, do they make sense anymore? Look at copyright, does it work on a national basis, kind of, not really. Um, only, only social systems, work. educational systems, business markets, economy, environment. Just to take the concept of environment, I don't know whether you have heard of Jeremy Rifkin, uh, who talks about the third industrial revolution. Um, industrial revolutions in the history of mankind have been defined as one new communication technology joins a new energy technology. And the first one was the printing press as communications technology, the new one and at the same time the steam engines and both together they might the first very big industrial revolution with matches the textile industry etc all these things you know that the second one communications technology was telephone fax radio tv those ele electric communication and at the other side the energy we have all the fossil fuel gas etc the old stuff so to say and again, very big economic development worldwide. But it's always this shape. And it always goes down when the time of that one industrial revolution is over. And the second industrial revolution is over. Fossil fuels have no future. Exactly. Electric communication has a very limited future, I would say. But we have at the horizon the third revolution, 
giving new opportunities again for the whole world. And that is the internet communication on one side and its clean new energy at the other side. So what, as a pirate party, do we do with it? Not that we are finished on that program, why we still work on it, but we would like, as you mentioned before, take the concept, for example, of the internet and transfer it to other topics, like energy. Why can an energy net not work like an internet? Totally decentral, not big exactly. nuclear yeah. plants somewhere, but have little energy plants on every single house. You can have solar panels on every house, you can have all other sorts of energy generation <coughs> on every house. You need new storage technology, every car could be a storage vehicle transporting energy from A to B, theoretically. Every house could have a plug, everybody could be charging or decharging energy. You don't need those stations anymore because everybody could do it decentral democratic wise, this would be a total revolution in many senses and these are the concepts we try to think of and that's a total different way of thinking about how we do politics. I'm interested in what I heard here today about a lot of liquid democracy. I'm a bit, um, I think I have less faith in it than you, but I think it's very interesting. I, I think it's exciting. I mean, the fact that it wouldn't, the fact that it won't necessarily work is certainly no reason not to try it. I think it's great that you're trying it. I think that's all. I think that's awesome, and I hope it does work. I often hope I'm wrong, and this is one of those times. Um, as far as, as far as copyright, I just wanted to say one thing, which is that you know people talk a lot about copyright in terms of big media companies. I don't think those companies are sympathetic. I don't think they're nice, um, but that shouldn't affect their rights. One of the principles of our society is that um, horrible <coughs> bastards have the same rights as very nice people. And um, the other thing is, you know, copyright is a personal right. This is based on contracts. You know, I, I chose to license my work. Other people can choose to give it away. And I'm not certainly not asking anyone to use an old business model or any business model. I just want the freedom to control my work the way I have um, the way I have that right, and I think everybody should have it. It's not something that's technically possible anymore. Well, it's, a lot of things aren't. It's, it was never technically possible. That hasn't changed. It was possible, but it no. It can't be done anymore. Okay, close this thing. Think, there's a lot. It's not technically <laughs> possible to stop technically. Okay, you got one against it. You guys can fight about that okay. over here. And, uh, maybe Anke, one more. Uh, I know we've covered many, 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 many topics here, but maybe there's one uh, central, central uh, thing you'd like to say. To force myself not to enter the copyright debate, I will not do it. Uh, we can discuss that later on. Maybe just one thing we may not have mentioned before. Yeah, yeah very short. It's. If we want more democracy and more people to have a say, we will get to hear things we don't like. And it will not always be fun, it will not be easy. Actually, more democracy is tougher than that what we had before. And we still have to embrace it and just know what to expect and then take all the effort. The outcome will be better, I believe in it. Thank you. I'm going to vote right there.